my name is Angela. Um, I'm the new breakfast director here in Berwick. Um, I don't know a lot of you guys yet. I've met some of you guys. Um, when I first got here, I didn't realize that we had this gem here. And um, when I stepped foot on here and then went into the office and tried to find all the maintenance stuff and tried to figure out, oh my gosh, what's happening here? Um, I couldn't find any of it. Um, so one of my things was to contact I contacted one of my old colleagues and he pointed me in the direction of Tom Irwin who are Scott and Ian here who are going to do the presentation for you guys. Um, but I am really happy that you guys are here today. Um, we've been working tediously over the next, or how many months has it been? It's three months now. Three months on how we're going to try to bring everything back up to par where it should be. Um, so we don't have to be spending a ton of money every year trying to bring everything back up, but to try to just maintain it and keep it sustainable um, for the upcoming future. Um, so is there any questions that you guys have right now before I turn it over to Ian and Scott so they can explain to you guys everything that we've been doing? No? All right, Ian. Crickets. Crickets. <laughs> Always a good sign. See that. Um, um, well, Scott's going to be my interpreter because obviously I'm from Old England, so there's going to be odd words and phrases that you look at and think, what, what's he just said? But um, no, thank you, Angela, and um, uh, great to meet everybody, and uh, thanks for making the effort to come along. And um, I, I want to say a big thank you at the very beginning of this because um, through this process, we've, um, we've carried out a lot of interviews, a lot of face-to-face -face discussions. Uh, we've spent many a day up here at the field um, reviewing, evaluating, measuring, and Scott will talk you through some of that in a minute. But really just want to thank you all that have managed to participate um, because without your participation, without your comments, without your answers to the questions that we ask in interviews, then we can't really get to the point we're at now. Um, you know, in the way we want to. We can certainly make our own assumptions, um, but we always like to have those assumptions, if, we, if we're going to make them, backed up by, you know, factual information where possible. So, so that, that just a, a, a great big thank you there. Um, as, as Angela was saying, my name's Ian Lacey. Uh, I'm the lead project advisor with Tom Allen Advisors. And um, as I jokingly said earlier, you know, I moved over to the United States uh, seven years ago from old England. And um, absolutely loving every part of life over here, and really uh, exciting for me to to develop um, our advice. Business. Not using that one. <laughs> now that was a bit early to tell me this. Yeah, we'll take it as it goes. But uh, yeah, excited to be able to develop our advisory business, and, and and over those years, we've spent a lot of time and effort with clients looking at feasibility studies. And I know that that sounds to be a, a, a one or two words of mystique there, so I'll, I'll hopefully open up and unlock just what a feasibility study is, as we look at it sort of certainly is. But, um, but yeah, I've spent pretty much my whole life in this career. Uh, I left school as a 16-year-old, walked on to golf golf, and, and I've spent the last 39 years you know, working in this industry. So I've, uh, I would say I've been around the, around the block a few times, as we say in England. Um, and I've seen a lot of things, and there are still things that, um, that you, you know, I'm learning. So, you know, it, it's great when we come to uh, towns such as Berwick, and, uh, and by the way, we pronounce it as Berwick in England, so when I first said I'm going to work at Berwick, everyone looked at me and said, where's Berwick? <laughs> where's the said, W? It's in Maine. No, there isn't a Berwick in Maine. There's a Berwick in Maine. Okay. All right. So, yeah. And I've, believe me, I've, uh, I've been to a few different places that, uh, that were called different, so. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, it's great when we come to, come to your town. And, um, and we really like to immerse ourselves in your culture, in what makes the town tick and talk, move and shake, all of those things. And, you know, sometimes we find things that um, may not be to the standards that we, we hope or wish to see. Um, but none of what we've done, what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, is meant in any way in disrespect to the efforts of people and groups. Um, over the years, um, we, we certainly don't second guess, you know, the, that that side of it. But um, 
but please allow us some some sort of flexibility when we're talking about some of the things that you know we've seen and found and measured and tested so that we can we can help you you know hopefully improve those things but before I get right into it I'd like to introduce my colleague uh, Scott Bowes. Uh, he's the technical um, advisor with, with Tom Owen, and he's going to tell you a little bit about himself first. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming out here tonight and uh, taking a vested interest in this you know, beautiful park here that we're hoping you guys will like our plan that we've put together to show, uh, continue improving and involving the park uh, to meet the demands of the community. So. As part of an important part of any feasibility study anywhere that we go is understanding what the existing conditions at the, the facility are. Um, so that way you know what the best way they are to improve them and wh where, maybe where the weak spots are where it should be addressed immediately. Uh, so I was up here for, we started at the end of March. Um, so the grass wasn't nearly as green yet. So it's great every time I come up here and you see, I see the fields improving already. Um, just as the weather's warming up and we've started our, our nutrition program and agronomic plan so far this year. So it's nice to see the benefits of that paying off already as well. Um, so the first, basically I had never been to the site along with Ian. So we always start our feasibilities with, you know, thank you Google for giving us the Google Earth so we can get a nice overview aerial of the place and kind of get an idea of the lay of the land before we actually get up here. Um, so our initial thoughts were to kind of break the park off into four turf areas. Um, that's what we wanted to assess first, the turf grass quality, the health, uh, what the soil conditions would be. So we have a, a proprietary test that we've put together uh, with the help of Ian he, when he came across over the pond. After working with FIFA, he had kind of put this testing method together for you know, fields all over the world to kind of grade them against each other to make sure that they are up to the same quality standards and fairly consistent for all the athletes. So we've taken a version of that that we've introduced here so that way we can use the same test to assess every field that we walk on basically. So we broke it off into the soccer field. Uh, I called this the West baseball field. So it's a major field, which Angela's corrected me on. Uh, the football field, which we call the football field. That's where I saw the football sleds and stuff out there. So that was what I was calling that with the t-ball area in the middle of it. And then we have the East field, which would be the minor field. So we go through and it's a, there's, basically three different cr main criteria that we look through at through our PQS assessments. And it would be the playability of the field, the presentation of the field, and the structure of the field. So the playability gets into a lot of performance testing. Um, I'm sure if anybody's an NFL fan here, they've heard of you know surface hardness testing with synthetic fields and players liking or not liking playing on certain surfaces. So there's different instruments that are out there to, that you're able to either drop a hammer or test to make sure that the field is consistent all the way through. So we've adapted those tools to be part of our PQS assessments. So as part of our playability standards, uh, we've, we went around and we checked the surface hardness of all the fields. Um, we've, we checked the, the moisture in all the fields uh, using a GPS guided system. So it'll actually map and save in the cloud every um, moisture reading that you take in the fields. So you're able to go back and check after you might have had a rain event to see if those, those moisture readings had come up or not. Um, so it was really interesting for me when I would go out and assess an entire field. It was very dry this spring when I first showed up. So the next week when I came up, we had had a little bit of rain. So when I had checked the fields, it was nice to see that they had all really recovered very nicely. Um, so another aspect of our you know, performance testing would be uh, looking at the compaction of the soil. Um, it's really important to not have too much hardness on the top. You want to be able to be able to, you know, move around and be able to get some grip on the surface, but you don't want it so soft where, you know, you're damaging the grass if you're when you're running around and trying to play your sport. Um, another aspect would be uh, rotational traction, which is a, a gauge that we put in the ground and twist. So it basically tells you, you know, how much torsion, uh, uh, shear strength that the, the surface may have. So this is a combination of all these tests that we conducted on all four of these fields. Um, and then along with that goes our structure tests, which I f was pleasantly surprised by all my readings up here. We have a profiler that goes about 12 inches deep. It's three inches wide by about one inches um, width. So you hit, stomp it into the ground as hard as you can, and then you take it out and you're able to see a nice picture of the profile going all the way down to the base 
And everywhere I went, this, this soil medium, while they were different according to our soil tests, um, they're fairly uniform all the way down through the profiles. Um, and it was nice to see some, some decent root growth already. Um, so it's, you, we're already building on something that was, like Ian had said, there there's, had been efforts been made here before, and now we're just going to try to you know, turn the dial up on those a little bit. So I think the fact that you have done all that legwork in the past is going to help everything kind of mature and, and come around even faster. Um, again, one thing I did notice in those soil profiles is there's a bit of a thatch layer in the top of the soil, um, which um, can lead to more incidences potentially for disease. But by hopefully by incorporating some cultural practices in the future, we're going to be able to kind of limit and reduce that. Um, and the last, so and along with those soil tests and the soil profile analysis would be uh, infiltration tests. So New England soils are typically very, very silty. Um, so they can be very tight and they have a lot of uh, capillary porosity is what they call it. So it can hold moisture, but it doesn't really do a great job of draining the moisture through. So when I ran my infiltration tests, again, it was, it was very nice to see that most of the fields were, were doing a fairly decent job above average from what I typically see at most um, municipalities fields that I see, probably about three to four inches in 15 minutes, which would equate to about 15 inches per hour, which is, which is pretty good considering that the soils aren't 100% sand, which is where you would really see good infiltration. One exception would be the football field back there. Um, it did definitely have a little slower infiltration to it. Possibly maybe the maintenance was done differently on those because it was kind of a multi-use field and, and different use area. Um, uh, and then also as part of, uh, in addition to all of our performance quality testing um, and which is very important to existing conditions is the surface gradients. So I was out here for one of my days with my laser and uh, you know shooting at least 12 points on the borders of each field along with some low spots in the center of each field um, and if I notice them in the middle of a field. And again the, the pitch and the gradients look very workable for the field, existing condition wise what you have up here. The soccer field has a nice pitch off to e either side of it. Um, the baseball fields, both of them kind of pitch towards left field and like any other field that you're going to find there's you know right field, left field, center field, typically, you know, if there's not too much action going on, there might be some players dancing out there, so they get, they get worn off a little bit. So they, they seem like there may be a little bit of settling over there, but again, with some, you know, maybe more repetitive and more, um, you know, diligently followed maintenance practices such as aeration and top dressing, I think you would be able to really limit those areas and get them to kind of plane out to the rest of the field and uh, without having to completely reconstruct the fields, which I'm sure some people were concerned about. Um, and then again, on top of the PQS assessments, one more Ian, sorry, is uh, we also did soil testing. So we had used two different labs. Um, one is Logan Labs and they do um, a very nice job of, you know, nutrient analysis and what's available to the plant in the soil currently right now. Um, and again, everything looked, looked pretty good and very workable. Um, we've been working with Brian Lucini, who's a Tom Irwin client representative, who's very knowledgeable in products. And he's put a, a plan together, which I think we're already kind of seeing, you know, the dividends pay off on. So, um, and another lab that we use is called Turf and Soil Diagnostics. And that's where we sent your infield clay material to get assessed. They have a baseball diamond performance evaluation. And everything, you know, came up to spec as to, you know, a very workable clay infield material. So. The grades might need to be played around with, and especially you can even notice from here a little bit of a lip going around the outside. So that might hold up any excessive water that might be in there. And, um, but off the top of my head, again, gradients are, are fairly decent. And then the last aspect was the uh, irrigation uh, evaluation, which we worked with uh, Smart Water Incorporated and uh, went through every head on the site just to see consistency of coverage. Um, we did pick out a few heads out there that were malfunctioning, malfunctioning uh, especially a few that were in the clay infield area. Angela was able to elaborate that that was a smaller infield at one point, so those heads were probably in the grass, and now they're in kind of the middle of the infield. So anytime you kind of have a head in the middle of an infield, it's very susceptible to any clay or material kind of falling into it, which can you know, damage or malfunction any of the gears that might be in there, and especially the seals on them, so they might leak a little bit more. So typically clays don't drain through very well, so if you do have excessive moisture, it takes a little bit 
longer, if there's, especially if there's low spots for it to get wicked away. Um, but there was a few heads out there who may have, maybe they had been changed in the past, and when a new unit got dropped in, the nozzle wasn't exactly the same as the other, or uh, uniform with the rest of the field. So one spot in particular is the back right corner of the soccer field, which um, people might know it's been typically a little wet over there. You got the little drainage ditch. And then there's also one irrigation head over there that when it was switched out, the nozzle that had gotten put into it is uh, putting out about five times as much water as the other nozzles in the field. So that, uh, that probably might have something to do with it as well. So, um, but again, it was a series of, I don't know, two, 300 prods into the ground all around the park. Uh, I dug two test pits, one in the center of the football field, one in the center of the soccer field, just so we can really capture what the soil horizons look like. And um, again, that confirmed what we got from the lab as well as what I found in the field, that the football field is draining a bit slower than the soccer field. But other than that, it seems like you know everything's very workable. And with a maintenance plan, everything should kind of come together and, and be able to um, you know, be maintained more efficiently for Angela here. So if anyone, I know that was a lot. <laughs> probably not, probably a lot nobody ever even thinks about just because uh, we, we do. I was just about to say, if you turn to the back page of your, of your, your um, handout, you'll see a test. And um, yeah. you need to yeah, answer all the questions right now. <laughs> no. no, but as you can see, we're very passionate about what we do. I get a little excited when I want to talk about what I find in the field because we, we definitely take a different, I do love dirt and walking through the woods. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was a great learning experience for me. And every time I was up here, there was people enjoying the park. So that was great for me to see too, after living in a pandemic for the past year and a half where you don't really have much human contact or seeing people enjoy working together and playing sports together. So the first night I was up here was when the baseball tryouts were. So I was digging my test pit and when I stuck my head out, there was about 150 people around the field and I was like, yes, we're back or we're getting there at least. So, um, but yeah, you guys, like Angela said, this is a diamond in the rough up here. So I think um, hopefully you guys like what our initial plans are for this place and we're looking forward to sharing them with you and getting some feedback, so. The clue was in the title. Technical advisor, there you go. Uh, you can't get more technical, no, no, thanks very much, Scott. Um, uh, great to meet you as well. Um, so now you all know about everything that we've done. So. Any questions? No. Um, well, I just sort of want to backtrack a little bit from Scott there. Um, so what Scott was, was, was talking about, remember I said at the beginning of this, I wanted to just sort of just open up what a feasibility study is. So really the first part of the feasibility study, as Scott has elegantly explained, uh, actually he's explained all three parts, but certainly the majority of the first part is the existing conditions. and. As he said, very, very um, important to us. We, we, we cannot make any recommendations, decisions, analysis until we do that part of it. Um, and it tells us so much, as you've, as, as you've heard from Scott. It, it tells us everything we need to know about the fields, but also about the infrastructure of the facility as well. Because we're not just looking at the athletic fields when we're looking at the feasibility study. We're also looking at, you know, um, the, the fencing, the pathways, the furniture that, that, that's around, the, the batting cages. Everything gets a sort of a review or an evaluation from us. Uh, and it's not, again, to be critical. It's just to say, right, okay, this is what you have. Um, when we follow that on with the next stage, we then start looking at what we call the infrastructure study. And that's where we look at things like, um, you know, what's the drainage capability of this facility? What's its irrigation, as Scott was saying, um, capability? Um, you know, New England in the summer, you get heat. You get a lot of heat up here. So how do we keep everything growing healthy so that everybody can enjoy using the facility, using the facilities, um, you know, certainly wherever, wherever the natural turf, um, you know, is. So, so that's a really important part of the study as well, because we need to understand where, as Scott was saying, there may be some weaknesses, there may be some areas where, you know, we see a hole there and we want to try and fill that. So how do we help you fill that? Um, for instance. So, so that's usually you know, the, one of the next steps we take in the study. Um, we also look, and, um, and this, is, uh, this forms a, a fundamental part of the feasibility, we, we carry out our what we call visions and values interviews. And when we're carrying those out, what we're really looking for 
is we're actually, you know, poking the bear a little bit. We're actually hoping that you don't tell us everything is fine. Um, we want your honesty. And, and for those people that have been unfortunate enough to have been interviewed by myself, you'll know that's how it looks. You know, we spend the first 20 minutes trying to understand each other, but the last 10, you know, actually getting something sensible out of each other. But uh, no, the, the, the idea of those interviews, and I remember Angela saying to me once, she said, what, what happens if people don't like something? And I says, great, we want to hear that. Because um, we're, going to ha we're going to have that whether we like it or not. So we'd rather understand it right at the beginning and say, well, this is the reason why we're carrying out the feasibility study. It's so that you can tell us your frustrations. You can tell us your disappointment from time to time. But also we want you to tell us what you like about you know, this facility, what you like about being part of Berwick's recreation movement, if you like. And um, so we take all of that information and we, we, it, it takes a long time to pull that information together. And for those who have been interviewed, and, and apologies, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to interview everybody, although I would have loved to have done that. Um, we ask two major questions. One is we give you three wishes and we say, what would you do with them? And no, it's not going to, you know, let, I'll have the, the winning lottery numbers and things like that. But if you had three wishes, what would you change? What would you, what would you say, I want to use one of my wishes to do this or change that? Um, and that's a quite a pointed question and we don't give you any real time to think about that. So it tends to be honesty that comes from that. Uh, and that's the way we like to, to do it. And I know, I know that people were very honest about that, and very fair, actually. And the other question, as we say, is, as pretty much we are now, if we were stood here in five years' time looking back and saying, hey, didn't we do well as a group, what would we be saying to each other? What would we be saying, hey, that's great to have that. That, that, was, that was never going to work the way it was. That was this. That, whatever, whatever you guys tell us. Uh, we just ask you questions, and we don't really direct you or put words in your mouth. We try and get those from you. And that then helps us as a team, because then we bring all of that back and we say, you know, we had some unbelievably good comments um, about the, the, the facility. Um, we, in, the, in the success you know, question, what would success look like, people were saying, this place should be a destination. Um, you know, there were one or two things that really stuck out that I don't often hear in all the interviewing that I carry out, but things like that, this, should place, this place should be a destination. And one of the things that struck me when I first arrived in Berwick was um, when I found out where the facility was in relation to the town center, I, I was absolutely, you know, you, you cannot believe how rare this is to have a facility such as this so close to your town centre um, and in such clo close distance to your community. Usually facilities like this are stuck out on the edge of towns because it's usually the only place you can, space-wise, you can put them. Um, but to have a facility that is in pretty much walking distance from the town centre, um, obviously as the new developments and new facilities are built you, you know, on the infrastructure of the town, for people to be able to just walk up here on a beautiful evening such as this, listen to the noise of, of athletic taking place, of recreation, um, that's a cool thing, I'll tell you, because you know, there's a lot of people who would, 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 would give a lot to be able to say that they had that. Um, so so you know, we, we pick up on things like that also, and, and Angela will, will tell you, you, you know, she'll laugh when I say this, but that car park over there, and I say car park, not a parking lot, and everybody says, what's a car park? But that parking lot, oh, car, I've said it. Um, she says, that's Ian's parking lot, because he parks up there, because he won't drive through the, um, the residential area. Uh, one, because speed bumps are the bane. We have more speed bumps in England than we did people, I promise you. But secondly, because I suppose it's my um, respect of people's, you know, um, uh, you know environment, and that if possible, why should we park outside of their properties? I actually went through that in England. I lived on a busy main road and, and it was used as a parking lot for anybody and everybody. So, so I, I probably have a little bit of a biased opinion to that. 
but but also you, you know you have a, a, a perfectly good car park that is off the main road it's easy access in and out and you don't have to go over 10 speed bumps and and, and and obviously take a lot of care around the residential area so so these are things that we notice and, and when Angela first walked me up to this field we walked up the main street and, and I was thinking wow this is great just to go to the town center and just walk up here this is this is like cool really cool um, so you know so, that, so there's a lot of things that we listen to that we garner that we um, gather um, to help us make some of the decisions that we then make but the first thing we really do once we've pulled all of this information together is we look and say what's a priority what's important what needs to be fixed what needs to be improved um, and there are some things that we look at it as Scott was saying more agronomically so things like your irrigation and um, the soils maybe the turf and things like that but there are also other things that we look at such as how is this facility being used so another part of our study is we carry out a usage analysis we take all of the usage that is takes place here and we put this into a, a calculator that we built and the reason we built it ourselves is because we couldn't find anything out there in the industry that made sense so our calculator is very particular to, to help us understand not just what is an hour of use look like on a field, but what is the user groups that are using that. So we've got the average foot size, the average weight, the average height of user groups. And I say average for that reason. Um, and we, we, we build that into our calculations. So we're not just saying it's one hour of use, because one hour of use from adults against under eight would be totally different. So we want to distinct that a little bit. And the other thing we do, which is equally important in our view, is whenever you have usage of facilities, you have to, where possible, match that with maintenance or upkeep of facilities. And if one is unbalanced and it's usually there's more use than there is maintenance capability, then we find that that creates um, you, you know a shortfall. Angela said it a little bit earlier in the in the discussion when she said we don't want to constantly have to fix things that then cost us a lot of money to fix. We call it the prevention against the cure. If we can prevent something it's usually far less expensive than the cure would be to cure it. Um, so we try and always work with any of our clients on that kind of mindset and it's not easy sometimes we have to start with cures sometimes to be able to get to a point of where we can then prevent in the future so that's very important to us that it may look like some of the things that we're recommending um, are absolute cures without without a question we wouldn't argue that with you but they're a cure to get us to a preventative point um, and that's the same with you know anything that you own you know your vehicles um, if you maintain them regularly they will generally look after you for a long long time but if you don't maintain them if you don't change the oils regularly if you don't change the tires then your bill is generally going to be a lot higher to to cure the problems so that's that sort of all of those things are mixed into the study uh, all of that data and when you get the reports as a town um, they'll be close to 300 pages of reports that you're going to receive from us. Now don't panic, we're not going to say read them all in one night for sure, but, um, but the way we build the reports is very, very efficiently from the perspective of the, of, of the readers. We put all of the really important information in the first few pages. Then we say if you really want to go and read exactly how we got to that information, there it is in our appendix for you. Everything is there. You can follow step by step. You know, you can become a Scot overnight if you read the part of the report that Scott is, is you know, particularly um, involved in for us. So, you know, he, and, and he's already given you a, a very elegant sort of view of that. So, yeah, there's, there's another hundred pages of that work. Um, but we think that to get you to read a hundred pages, to get to one page of uh, this is what we think, this is what we suggest, 
is a bit tough on anybody. So we reverse it round, we say this is what we think, and this is how we got to that. So that it's quick and easy for you to be able to make decisions. Some of the decisions that, that you'll see in your, in your little handout here um, were fairly easy decisions for us to help you make, in our view, um, uh, and, and relatively inexpensive, actually. Um, so that's what we tend to pick on that low-hanging fruit first, and, and obviously where, when it makes sense. But where we need to, um, what's the word, where we need to take a little bit more time and build out the thinking, build out the vision, then yes, we will take that time. So what we're going to show you throughout the course of the next sort of 15, 20 minutes is some of the original plans that we've put together. Now, I'll, I'll be absolutely honest with everybody right now. We're not a team of architects. We're not architecturally trained. We're not engineers. But I think what we do provide is a great mix of that type of, of knowledge and understanding. Even though we don't have the qualification or the stamp to go with it, um, we're highly qualified professionals in our own right, in our own industry, um, but we've learned that form follows function. So what, make sure that it works first before we actually then go and design something. Um, I've seen it so often and so has Scott, and we do a lot of investigative scenarios where we go to things that haven't worked. And they haven't worked because the design was fabulous, but nobody thought about how to really build it or maintain it. So whenever we work with clients, we start with maintenance and we work backwards. We say, before we go and build you whatever you want building, let's just start with, can you maintain it? Will you be able to maintain it? So we carry out a similar type of, of approach to a feasibility. We look at all of those things that, that you need, equipment, people, usage levels, all of those things, and that brings us back to making the right decisions. And invariably, we, 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 we do provide success at that point because we've taken that approach. So this is exactly how we've approached this study. We've looked at it. We've looked at what needs to be hopefully improved, fixed, um, uh, and, and, and so on. But we've started always with maintenance. Um, when we show you these plans, you're not going to see a wonderful design of, uh, of things. Our view is you have, as Scott said, a hidden gem here. So let's shine it up a little bit. Let's make it work best for you. Let's look at how we can develop the usage more efficiently and effectively across the facility. Let's look at how, from many of the interviews that we carried out, where people were saying that it felt cold when they walked in. Um, that it, in one case, somebody said to me, it felt like I'm coming to prison. Um, it felt like I'm in the prison yard when I come into this facility. And, and that's tough for us to hear because we know that nobody intended that. But, um, but it's also sobering for us to hear because it helps us then make sure that if we can help a little bit with that and change that to a more positive outlook, that then people will 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 come and, and, and enjoy um, you know the facilities. You've all seen the Kevin Costner film, you know, if you build it they will come. Um, and that's pretty true about pretty much everything that we have in athletics uh, in our industry is if we build something that's really inviting, that really looks like, yeah, I can bring my family here. I'm not just going to bring my children here or youngsters to play sport. I'm actually going to be able to recreate here. I'm going to be able to relax, enjoy, watch the younger children play, while I can still watch my older children play, you know, and have this sort of captain's ship view of the facility. And that's what we've tried to, you know, keep as our sort of guiding light to, to this facility. Um, Put it up. Yeah, so I, I think what we want to do now is just, and again, you've got all of these drawings in the back of your handout. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we looked at, and, and we've had many conversations about this, is um, we've looked at the location and the orientation of certain things and thought, 
if we were able to, you know, move something, twist something, turn something, would that make it better? Would that make it more accessible for usage? Would it make mm. it more encouraging and inviting as a potential hub, if you like, um, area-wise? And and so that's that's some of the things that we're looking at here in just phase one. And, and these are backed up with the statements that you'll see. Um, excuse me one minute, just so I find it. The chart? On the, on the sort of the action plan um, pages that you'll see, we've, we've broken them down into one to three years, and, uh, or, all, or a first three years, and then, and then onwards. So again, nothing of this is set in stone. If people think that that pace is too slow, that's fine. That's what we want to you know, start garnering you know, thoughts and ideas uh, from. And really, um, we're not saying that this is, is it, and we're not going to take any other ideas or other thoughts. Um, but we have to start somewhere for the town, and we have to use what we've had um, as evidence and information to help us and guide us in, in the right sense. So one of the things we've looked at is, and again, a lot of these potential concepts and changes have come from the interviews, have come from you guys yourselves saying, don't like this, I'd really like to see that, this would be great. So we've tried to capture those as much as possible. Uh, now unfortunately we can't do everything. Um, we could have just wiped the slate clean and just said let's just start again. Um, you know, in reality, that's an extremely difficult thing to achieve. Um, would we all like to do that? As Would success be in five years' time? Let's just knock it all down and build it back up? Yeah, potentially. Um, the, the issues around something like that, the challenges around something like that, the budgets alone, everything would be a huge challenge. And would we actually move forward at the end of it? Would it create a better facility where people would come and you know recreate and play sport potentially yes but i've also seen it where that doesn't happen um, so i think what we tried to look at was you have a great skeleton here so let's just put some meat on those bones and and develop something that makes more sense and it's more easy to um, achieve um, so that you can have um, a lot of things changing for you in a quicker period of time. So that's why in, in phase one, you'll see the tennis court, basketball courts as, as we've looked at them. We, we're, we're looking at moving them and basically turning the orientation on them. Um, and that way then, the play areas, which obviously I think to most people, the play areas are old, tired, um, in some cases unsafe, um, or potentially unsafe. So what we're looking at is, well, let's put a real exciting state-of-the-art play area really close. If we move the basketball tennis court out, we create the space. As you can see here, here's the, here's, uh, and you, you've got your own copies of this, but if you see the normal, the existing on, uh, orientation, we're not actually going to shift it that far. We will lose one or two trees, but we'll replant those. And, and we'll, you know, we'll replace everything that we have to either lose or remove. Um, but then it allows us the opportunity to bring the play area closer to this facility, which is really where it should be. At the minute, it's stuck out in two different parts of the facility. So if the weather's not too kind, you know, you've got to look over there and watch Joey over there, and you've got to watch Jill over here. And it just makes it very difficult and, and really doesn't connect very well. So what we want is that when you come here, especially for the younger, uh, for, for parents, you know, we want them to be able to park the, 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 the I call them push chairs. Do you call them push chairs over here? Strollers. Strollers, sorry, yes, yeah, strollers. I shouldn't know that because I've been to Disney World so many times and say strollers. Wouldn't it be but, a pram? Yeah, strollers. Wouldn't it be a pram? A pram, yeah. Well, a pram's a very posh stroller, I would say. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But um, yeah, that you can park that here 
And then you have everything that you need. You have pickleball or other, you know, um, types of sports. You have your basketball. You have the play area. Um, nothing is going to get removed and not replaced. Um, what will happen is just things will move, we think, to a more appropriate part of the facility. Um, so that, that's sort of where we're looking. Um, Can I pop in for a second? Yes. I also want to let you guys know that we do have Diana here. She's from Utilify. Sorry, Diana. <laughs> yep. She's a playground rep. Um, she also has been a director for Park and Recreation for 23 years at Hampton. Um, so she's got a lot of experience and they also do a lot of adaptive stuff, inclusion, playgrounds and stuff like that, which is why um, I have reached out to her because we want to do more of an inclusive playground, if anything. Um, and their company does a really good job with it. Sorry. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, sorry Diana. Yeah, that's, that's um, Notice the way we, we haven't gone into detail with the play area. What we've just said is that we think that this is one of the better positions that it could be put in. And then we can let Diana do her magic and, and really, and again, it could be a consultative process where you know we sit like, as we are tonight and really talk about, well, I really like this and we'd like this and we'd like this and this might work. And what about this for the older children as well as the younger children? So. You know, that's where Diana comes into her own and, and, and her expertise is, is essential to this. Um, what we wanted to do was just to be able to give Diana the footprint uh, in the right place um, to, to be able to develop those, um, those plans, those ideas, those concepts, and those visions. So, again, just some other things that we're talking about. The batting cages would actually move over to the far side where the swing set is now which we feel would be a much more safer position to have them. Um, they're cages anyway, so they're not sort of, you know, um, essentially unsafe by any means, but just having them out of the way where, you know, people can concentrate on their coaching and things like that, because, you know, we want this place to feel very warm and very warm and very um, loving. To, to everybody that, that comes here. If we get that real, you know, um, different weather, the rain, things like that, then people can at least, you know, shelter and still, you know, watch something going on out there. So, so that's sort of some of those things that we're looking at. We're also looking at that we need to improve the irrigation, as Scott mentioned. So part of the low-hanging fruit that you'll see in the, in the first um, chart, if you like, is a lot of those infrastructure things, you, you know, being fixed, being improved, so that we can then take care of the athletics much better. We can then make sure that those fields can take more use and allow you to use them more and allow you to use them and spread more um, so that those things can take place. Um, we don't always want to be fighting the fire, as we say. What we want to be able to do is put the fire out and make sure it doesn't come back. And doesn't start up again. So, so that's a sort of a snapshot of 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 what phase one could look like. Um, again, not set in stone particularly, but you know, just some early thinking, some things that you know, if they happen in the sense that they happen, will then create more opportunities for this facility to to develop. Um, but already, just by we think by moving some, you know, rotating some things around, moving stuff, rebuilding stuff in, in the right areas such as, you know, playscapes, things like that, then we feel as though that will, that will at least help, you know, a, a, a more community family approach to the facility. And it's not to say that families don't use this facility, because I've seen that, but I think what we want to make sure is that when a family walks through either of the entrances, is that we're saying, welcome, we're going to keep you safe, we're going to let you in, we're going to hope you enjoy yourselves here today with us, you know, and that should always be our aim as a, you know, as a facility in a town. Um, and along with what goes with phase one here is also like we're, I talked about briefly as a maintenance plan, a more robust maintenance plan for all the fields, um, just to kind of help round them all into form. Um, we, we've said, you know, reconstructions, it really puts a you know, it shuts a field down for a while and then you have to hope that it grows in properly and then you have to have the maintenance set up to maintain it once it does come back. So we feel it's, it's very 
possible and it's going to be more efficient for users um, to just create a better maintenance plan for the, for the turf so that way it can steadily and continually improve while people are still able to use them. So, so that's, that's potentially phase one, and that's taken into account with all of the things that we, we found um, you know, through, through the study. Should we move this? Do you want to ask if there's any questions on phase one? For any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. I, I have a lot of stuff that I don't want to do with it. I think that we should talk on the side. I'm the president of the baseball program. Okay, right. Yeah, we have to talk, but there's a few things on there that make it a little bit, a little bit more <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's no problem. I mean, again, you know, the 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 the, ident the the ideal of the public forum is to inform you of what we've been doing and what we suggest may be a way forward. I, again, it doesn't you know doesn't come without consultation, and and I know that you know unfortunately we try to connect so that we can interview, but um, but we'll certainly we'll certainly listen to your concerns or you know your thoughts or ideas you know um, at any point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think again, just to say that this is not a finite night in the sense that what we're saying now, it, 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 that isn't us completely finished our study, but we are getting we are getting towards the end of that now. So there may still be you know some consultation that we want to have and need to have, um, but um, but we are coming towards the end uh, of the study now. So you know we're going to want to be able to wrap up. Um, you know, our final reports relatively soon, in the next two to three weeks, I would say. So that gives us still plenty of time to talk and, and, and move stuff around. Okay? I would just add, yeah? uh, it's not a question, but I'm just happy to see, like, the pickleball go in, because it's awesome that there's a ton of things for the younger generation and the kids to do, but it would be really nice to incorporate some things that the silver citizens can do. Yeah. And, um, you know, pickleball is really growing in popularity. And oh, having yeah. done in the town would be pretty awesome. Yeah, it's, it's fairly huge, pickleball now. We it's a new request. Yeah. Everywhere we go, everyone, everyone wants go, a pickleball yeah. court. People, people are, are saying to us, you know, can that be included? Uh, sometimes. Yeah, it's all ages. I mean, kids yeah. still use it too, but yeah. it's something like yeah. the seniors yeah. Absolutely, Absolutely, yeah. And you already have the footprint there, which is great. You know, it'd be a fairly easy transition from the basketball. It'd probably even take up less foot space than you have there right now. Yeah. All right, ready? The reason why you have, there's no, there's no 20.3 on here. Is that like a catch-up year? Like your first phase says 21, 22, 23. I think that's just in case something from 22 or 21 doesn't get done, you have that year. And also, we wanted to hear feedback from everybody else here tonight if they want to see something moved up or, you know, switching orders and how we have it laid out for our first draft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Round two. So as, as, as part of the continuation, you know, um, we built the solid base initially and then what we're trying to do is then continue to develop the, the, the concept uh, of, uh, of, you know, the, the changes to the park, uh, to, the, to the field, sorry. Um, one thing we actually talked about, and we've talked about this with Angela, is, um, you know, I was interested that it was called Memorial Field, and I'm sure it's... Um, memorial field, and, it mean, and it's a special meaning to everybody, or, or certain people within the within the town. But we wondered whether if uh, renaming it Memorial Park might be more appropriate, you know, moving forward. Um, but that's just a just that's just a hand grenade I'm throwing in there. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that it has I'll, to be. I'll but, guarantee you that nobody knows why it's called Memorial Field. Yeah, yeah, well, that's. I don't even call it Memorial. The rec field. The rec field. It's just the rec field? Yeah. Right, okay. All right, so yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it could be Memorial Recreation Field or Park or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so so now what we're doing now is, is, if you like, just developing the thinking now. Moving from that initial, um, you know, um, reorientation of one or two facilities, the build of new facilities, where, where we think is, is appropriate. And then we're starting to add a little bit more now into... Um, you know this central area um, so again now we're talking about now we we might not have the batting cages here that we're talking about extending this shelter 
to the same footprint again, so it moves out further. And that also gives us an extra protection on the play area because now the errant ball that's coming from, you know, left-hander or even a right-hander, um, you know, has a little bit more of a, of a challenge to get over and, and into, the, the, into the sort of the play area. But we can also mitigate that anyway by putting up, um, you, you know, what we call pulley net systems, which basically just allow us to lift the net up another 20, 30 feet when a, when a baseball ball game is taking place and then drop it down when it's when it's not in use. Um, so so again, just options there. So so the, the, the shelter would extend out. And again, part of the, the reason for that and the discussion on that was that, um, you know, Angela was saying that, that she'd had feedback from people that when there was a, a, a sort of a community event, if it rained, there was really nowhere for anybody to go. Everybody had to sort of snuggle under here. So we thought that if we extended it out and created another equal amount of space, then at least you could run activities, you know, under here to some degree. Um, and that might be, you know, something that would help. Also, if, um, you know, if people uh, just wanted to spend more time relaxing here, there's more space because obviously if we build a play area here, potentially, if, and now we're talking about maybe a splash pad, um, which again was a, was a big point of contention from a lot of people I interviewed, then if we put a splash pad here, this is going to be a hive of activity. So we're going to need more space for people to come and sit and, re and relax and, and, uh, and feel safe. So, so yeah, so they're really the big, the big additions uh, on this are, you know, the splash pad area and also the extended shelter. But I think the, the biggest addition um, would come, you know, in what we call a pocket park. So one of the big um, one of the big discussions that came out of the interviews was that people felt that that it was just a, a sports facility and it was very cold and there was nothing for not just the the, the older generation, greatest respect, um, but also for the younger generations, um, somewhere where they could recreate um, passively without having that feeling of I'm just in a sports facility and I'm surrounded by sport all the time and I'm not. Believe me, I'm a massive sportsman, so I'm not, I'm not on the case of sport at all. But I think one of the things we really looked at is there is an area that is over to uh, the far side here that just isn't getting used for anything at the minute. So we said, well, wouldn't it be a good idea to make that a small park? Um, and again, we haven't developed the thinking much more than that. But just somewhere where people can go sit out the way, um, you know, just relax, um, still watch sports, still take in the facility, but have a little bit more of a relaxation. Um, so when sport is taking place, yes, they can sit over there, they're away from that noise, they're away from that excitement, um, and they just have something where they can say, this is ours. And this is just a nice quiet place to bring my family, to bring my youngsters and just let them run around and kick a ball with them or, you know, throw a ball with them, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a sort of a small way. So, so again, not really built this out. We, we see uh, an opportunity to put a pathway through the middle of it or, 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 or weave a pathway into it um, and then have a, a, a connecting pathway running around the outside, which would eventually, uh, we see it connecting to the whole of the fields, uh, uh, so that we have a walkway around the whole of the fields. Um, and we actually did this down in the, the city of Lawrence in, in Massachusetts. We actually designed a soccer field with a park, a small pocket park, and a walk, uh, a walking path all the way around. And, and, and that is due to be opened in two weeks' time, so, We'll see, but everybody was very excited about it from from the early from the early sort of discussions. So, you talk about the workout benches. Yeah, so these blue areas, which again you've got them on the R maps, that we, we thought we might just put little exercise benches there, workout benches, so they, they double up as a as a place to sit, but also a place to do some gentle exercise. Um, you know, and again, nothing set in stone, but just you know some thoughts and ideas. We also looked at from my car park. 
having a different entrance so that you go directly to that park and you don't have to come in through the baseball, uh, around the baseball field to get to it. So you could certainly access it that way, but we just felt it might be nice just to have a, a, a more secluded entrance, you know, to take, um, to take you straight to that. Um, and certainly people that I've met when I've been up here, just generally, um, you know, observing, um, I've, I've met a lot of people that do like to just walk around this park, uh, this, sorry, this field. Um, you know, so why don't we give them something to walk around um, in that sense? So, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of, you know, um, our thinking, um, you know, regarding phase two. Any questions? Yeah, I did, but I didn't expect right now. Um, <laughs> That's okay. So I live in Rowing, and I've lived my whole life. How was the splash pad had worked with the water? We have. Uh, I live down the road, and my water turns brown. So I'm just picturing kids in a splash pad with brown water. Yeah. So the way splash pads work is, if you imagine uh, basically a swimming pool, um, they work on pretty much the same system. So. Um, the water that is sprayed out of them is then collected through a collection system. It's then filtrated, uh, treated, um, and then it's pushed back out as, as you know, clean water or, or as clean as the water can be. So that's how a lot of them work. They're on a they're on a self-contained um, you know basis. We thought about putting the splash pad in this vicinity for two reasons. One, because we felt as though it would be close enough for parents just to keep a close eye on. On children and also it's near all of the uh, main pipe work for the water main coming into the into the facility so it made sense then just to tap into that rather than to have Jody and his team run a pipe you, you know from somewhere else in the facility um, but again you know it's uh, it, they're generally uh, very safe um, from a from a water quality perspective at least um, like anything, they need to be maintained, they need to be checked, they need to be monitored. But I think, again, if, if, we, if we go down that route and, and one of those is installed, then you know, there'll be a proper sustainability and infrastructure that goes with that. But, um, but again, just, um, just a nice area, especially when it gets really hot up here, which it does. And I've already seen it, you know, I was up here a few weeks ago and we had that little heat wave and it would have, I would have jumped in that splash pad had it been there. So, you know, certainly, and, you know, great for athletes as well when they're finished and they can just walk in there, you know, let their feet cool down, things like that. No, we're not going to ask them to go for a shower in there by any means, but, you know, just to be able to just, oh, yeah, oh, this is so cool, you know, those types of things. So there's a lot of uses that we can get out of something like that. But, um, again, that was something that came out of a lot of um, the interviews that I, that I carried out. Um, so it might not be to everybody's liking, but um, but that's you know we thought that might be certainly um, something to look at. One question, yeah. yeah. Um, when you talked to Jody, did you talk to about the amount of pressure of the water? Because that pipe is huge coming in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of water pressure going in yeah. up that. So obviously, you know, from from a splash pad perspective, there would be reducers uh, that would be installed that would stop that pressure. They already have what we call an expansion tank for the irrigation system. So basically what an expansion tank does, which is what it would do for the splash pad actually, um, it regulates water pressure. So while the mains pressure may be, let's say, 300 PSI, the, we set the expansion tank at say 160 PSI. So it always keeps the water pressure. It's the, it's the, the safety valve, if you like. Because if we didn't, then we'd blow the irrigation heads off. Most of these irrigation, hmm. yeah. most of these irrigation heads would blow off, as we found out last weekend. Yeah. Yes. Um, but no. So the, yeah, that, that great point, though, Sandy. There's a there's a there's a, a diffusing system that that is um, that is installed with them, so that it's not the full pressure of the mains coming in that goes out into the splash pad. And then there's a regulation even on the splash pad from that point on. Uh, as a part of a, a, a regulation on the on the water pressure, so that it's not too pressurized for young children as well as you know young people.
So. I think there's other infrastructures for them too. Like when we were researching them the other day briefly, yeah. some of them will have like their own sump below them. It's only, yeah. I think it was about 200 gallons and then you can have your own pump running off of it. Yeah. So as long as you have the water, you know, it's yeah. pretty much self-sufficient from that point. So if yeah. that was, if the pressure did seem to be an issue, there are other options for the infrastructure yeah. for them. Uh, play around with the valves too and adjust them. Yep, um, that's right. Yeah, yeah they all the come, we they generally come adjustable where you can increase the pressure slightly on some valves or diffuse that pressure. So it sprays more of a, a mist than a than a, a water fountain. So so yeah. All right. Last one. Okay. So some of this is conceptual thinking for sure, um, because we can't say for uh, sure just yet. Um, certainly, this piece of land, which is basically. Um, to the far side of the soccer field at this minute. If that land could be purchased and it could be developed, then the potentially we could turn soccer fields from one into two, which would create a lot more space. Um, we could also have a different sport playing on one of those fields as well, such as lacrosse or something like that. So, you know, again, trying to be and think about inclusivity. Um, you know, we're well covered with baseball, we're well covered you know, with areas for soccer, which is great. Um, football doesn't really need a football field. It likes to use this facility for practice. So again, you know, we're, we're hopefully taking those, those, those thoughts into consideration as well. Um, lacrosse is definitely missing from this facility and would like to be part of this facility. It's made that clear to me. Um, so yeah, so, you, you know, again, that this may be, you know, a few years plus down the line. But it's not to say that it, that it can't happen. Um, and so we did some rough calculations and there is enough room to basically get the size of soccer fields you would need um, orientated this way. Now, yeah, I know what you're going to say to me. Um, orientation has to be northwest, you know, to northeast, whatever, somewhere in the north um, as much as possible. But I think, again, you know, um, the, the kids wear sunglasses all the time. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I appreciate that would be an issue. So it might not look exactly as the plan says. We might be tilting them slightly um, so that we can work with the orientation and the sun, the sunrise and sunset as much as possible, um, you know, with that in mind. There is a stream down there too. Um, Angela and I and, we, and Tom went for a nice nature hike as part of my investigation. So we were bushwhacking through all there to check out the land. There's a little stream that runs down through that, which might be nice for some walking paths, but it, it does come a bit tight to the corner of the fence as it is right now. So yeah, maybe by, you know, twisting the fields, maybe at like a 15 degree angle or something, you'd probably be able to bypass that. But. Is that considered a, an actual stream? It's considered a vernal pool? Oh, vernal pool. So he's a bunch oh, of... <laughs> Permitting and stuff. More stuff done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's interesting. All right, vernal pool. <laughs> okay, I like that very much. Well done, Sandy. Yeah. Okay. Can we just I'll mark that up in the notes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> okay. We'll okay. go with vernal pool for sure. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So again, um, you know, we. We've now developed a lot of the area of the facility. Um, this is one area that, that would be great. Um, and, I, and I know that, you know, baseball, T-ball at the moment currently sits, you know, in this position. I forgot to mention this, that we would look to move that. Um, not, not lose it, just move it, because it's, um, it's valuable space that football and soccer could, could also utilize for their practices. And I think that, um, you know, if we if we if we move it to another part of the facility, it's still going to be available um, for for that game to be played. Um, so you know, again, we're trying to be all things to all people where we can. But sometimes, you know, we 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 know we're going to slightly upset somebody, but uh, hopefully not too much. Um, Don't the blown up. So yeah, so what we've what we've done in the in the smaller maps that you have, we've then blown up this this sort of central area again, just so you can see how it now starts to look um, and how it starts to fit. Um, so yeah, so we had talked about. I mean, it might be just 
again, going by our aerial shots and how big a double basketball court would be, there may not be enough for two full ones, but that definitely seems like one of the most popular sports I see when I have come up here is there's always mm -hmm. someone shooting hoops up there. If not a couple, you know, there's a pickup game going on. So uh, like Ian was saying, we've done a few other projects in Lawrence, Mass, and we weren't part of the basketball court that they had built at O'Neill Park, but it, it's a really fantastic um, design of what they've done. It's basically a long oval, so that way you get your full court running the long ways, and then you have two shorter courts running on each half going, um, going the short way. So if you had multiple games going on, you'd still be able to accommodate that. So um, in case, so that might be not squared off, like we're saying, with two full courts, but it'd still be an option to have you know, two smaller courts there. Yeah, the reason we don't go to AutoCAD drawings at this stage is because they're very expensive to, to you know, develop. And really, you know, if we're going to have rotten tomatoes and cabbages thrown at us tonight, then we'd rather do it on a, a relatively cheap sort of, you know, we're, we're cheapskates in that sense. But, um, but no, it, it's, the concepts are always something that we're always in development with, with people. Um, we put a concept out there, you know, some people love it, some people don't. So what we want to try and find is what is that happy medium where people will say, well, okay, as long as I get a pickleball card, I can accept other things, you know, happening here as well. And, and that, that's fine. That's the, that's the quid pro quo, as we say, that, that makes it, you know, work here. And I think the, the, one of the things, that, Scott, if we just go back to that, that, that aerial, one of the things that, that you see here really is, is, again, just trying to make this more of a hub to the community. Yes, the sports are vital to this, to this, to this facility, without, without question. They're, they're dominated by, uh, we're dominated by the sports here, so, and that's fine. That we, we want that. This, you know, this country is built on sport just as my country was, is. So we, we understand that, but I think if we can soften this facility as well, so that we make it more approachable, amenable, accessible to a wider ranging um, set of age groups, generations, um, you know, okay. things like that. Um, I, I've lived in Burrow my whole entire life. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time here when my kids were little, but that was 25 years ago. This is the first time I've been back. Hmm. Wow. You know, I haven't been here. But wow. Thanks well, we got along. notice through Facebook and stuff that they were looking at, you know, refurbishing some things. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, I wonder if we can get pickleball. So I think I'll be on the ball. And uh, like, that's, that's great. I love um, it. Exactly the same. I mean, I've, I think we were here probably every night when the kids were yeah. in baseball. First state yeah. championship happened right here, and I have This is the first time I've been back. Yeah. Wow. You know, Elijah's 25 now, so. Um, I think I don't think it's just important. It's crucial if you're going to get the money for this. It needs support, and people aren't going to support it unless they're part and engaged in it. And I love the baseball, I love the sports, but this is a town asset it belongs yes. to the whole town. And so it's like a ball, and it's a park. And we have so many new families coming in, yeah. younger children, and they don't know where this is. So this will be. The best thing that we can possibly do is just to get it so it's warm. Yeah. Yeah. Little thing. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, we don't have all the answers on these maps for sure. We we don't profess to. But but I think what we've done is we've listened as much as we can to everybody that we've interviewed or met or worked with, and they've told us that that what's on these maps is needed. That's not really us saying, yeah, we're the clever ones here. You know, we we've, we've taken all of your information. And we try to translate it into something that makes more sense. Um, you know, uh, it's funny. I said to Angela, just I'm just worried about the time. Oh, I'm okay for time. Normally, I start getting people waving at me now, saying "shut up, Ian." But uh, one of the things I've said to <laughs> thanks, Tom. One of the things I've said to Angela is, I said, as simple as the car parks not being lined out. You know, it, it gives you that impression that it's not organised. Um, they don't have to be, they don't have to be paved, but just having the car parks marked out so that people can see that there's a structure, that there's a format here that you follow, then just being able to park anywhere you like, and, and, and I, I understand that, but it's, that's what we call low hanging fruit to us, 
um, it wouldn't be expensive just to spray some lines on there and spend some time and effort on that type of thing. And it's amazing that when you do things like that, people will park and, and you, you, most people, most, most normal people, I will say, will park in a parking space. You know, they're not going to park in the middle over two, so I know you see that occasionally. Um, but most people will park in a parking space and, and you know, and, and be, be fair with other people with that. So things like that, I think, give it more structure, give it more organization, actually make it feel, yeah, this is, a, this is, this is that destination. We're not just coming to a park anywhere, do what you like type approach. We're coming to a facility that says, we want you to park here, please. We want you to respect each other. The respect always starts with before you actually walk in the facility. You know, you guys as coaches for all of your sports, you're teaching that to, to the youngsters all the time. You know, the respect has to start, you know, before you even put the strip on type thing. Um, you know, so things like that. Fencing, yes, I haven't really mentioned it, but you know, um, I don't like any of the fencing that's here. Um, so believe me, if I could pull it all down tomorrow, I would. If I could put it back up again, I would. Now, what do we put it back up with? Well, we may end up with, and this is going to sound a bit contradictory, similar type fencing, but just better quality, better coloring. We can put screens across some of the fencing, make it more vibrant. Why don't we get our high schools now, middle schools now, you know, elementary schools involved, help them create a tapestry type approach and then it goes on the, the basketball court, it goes there, it goes here. Just give them identity, give them something that makes them want to then come up here. Angela came up with a great idea. Most of the kids get here on their bikes. So let's let's encourage them to bring their bikes. Not to roam around the fields in, but to at least be safe to get here. And then we park, we allow them to, to put their bikes in bike racks and and be safe with that. And then we say to them, this is, we, we respect that this is a facility that's gonna have lots of different activities going on, sometimes all at once. So riding a bike around, you know, has to be done with very great care and, and attention. So, but park it there at least, rather than just leave it on the wall. And, you know, watch the kids bring them in here, line them up against the, 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 the benches. Well, let's find them somewhere where it, again, it's organized. We have everything in its right place. And, and that way it's safe, it's secure, and then people can enjoy the facility rather than trying to trip over a bike to get past somewhere and things like that. It's not the kids' fault, you know. I mean, I used to I lived on my bike when I was their age. So, but let's give them something, something, somewhere to be able to park that bike and look after them. And then we can look after them. Then we can say welcome. You know, welcome right at the beginning. You walk through that, that main entrance, uh, or, or right through to the, to the edge of that main entrance, and then you're in. One last thing we talked about um, was the, the building behind us, uh, behind you, should I say. And um, I, I went up there with Angela one day, and we were looking around, and it's a fabulous storage space, by the way. And, um, and I said to Angela, I said, you know, imagine if you opened all of the shutters open, it would be like you're the captain on your on the bridge of your ship, and you're just, you know, looking at. I'm sorry, I get a bit visual with these things, but you see where I'm going. I'm not saying she's going to be Captain Picard, but you know, um, you, you get. She gets a great view of the whole facility. So then we developed it, and I said to Angela, "How about if we moved you up here, because she's in a dungeon down in the office. Make no mistake." Like, I go in there, I think I've been sentenced for something, you know? So what about having her up here? What about, what about you know, developing the upstairs into an office space for Angela and for the recreation department? Then they're right here. They're right where we need them, where the facility needs them, where the user groups need them. If there's a problem, Angela's here. She doesn't, I know she hasn't got to come far, and Chris and, and the guys haven't got to come far, but they've still... Why not put them? Why not, why not have them here? This is a perfect opportunity. And you wouldn't say that if this facility was on the edge of town because Angela would be too far away from the town hall and where she needs to be from time to time also. 
Well, yeah, if we there. converted it into a living space, you can just stay here. <laughs> yeah, your commute's yeah. here anyway all the time. Spoken like a true Rex director. It's like a bonus, saving on the gas money. Spend your life there, that's what we'd like. It would be part of the job. Angela, it's going to be that prison, but it's just going to be titivated over. It's going to look good. Yes, Tom. When you talk about it being in the dungeon, is originally... That was the jail cell. Oh, so, right. The police station. Well, there you go, you see. There's my sixth sense telling me that already, you know. But, uh, yeah, so, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm jesting a little bit about, about the dungeon. Not really. No, but, but, uh, but it was the jail cell. You know, yeah. let's, let's have a rope here. Let's have a easy access to you guys. So when you're coaching or you need something or the irrigation system breaks, she's here. And, um, I mean, Angela knows more about irrigation than we do now. Yeah. Um, because over the past two months, we've been working with each other trying to fix, um, you know, some of the issues. But So, obviously, having that facility for ourselves, even if it's only a summer office, Let's say that we, it's going to cost too much money initially to get it winterized for her, you know. Um, but of course, what are we doing in the winter here? There are so many things we can do in the winter that we haven't really thought about too heavily at the moment. Um, but there are things that you can do in the winter here, you know. So again, just a thought, it's a concept, but I do believe that the best place for Angela and her team is here because then they're right at, um, you know, touching distance with everybody. And, and I've seen Angela already in action, and she's gonna hate me for saying this, but I've seen her in action, I've seen her the way she interacts with the, with the kids that come up and they're playing basketball and oh, that's a great shot. And, you know, and th that's the type of thing we, we get from Angela and, and from the team, we get that interaction, you know. Um, uh, so, so, so there's another thought. And, one of the final things I'd like to leave you with, at least, um, before we really open it up to questions. Thanks, Scott. Scott's been great, hasn't he? Um, <laughs> is the maintenance of the facility. So yes, we have already helped Angela put a, a really dedicated program together to improve the facilities even more than, than, than when we found them. And that's needed because our usage analysis told us that there was too much use and not enough maintenance and that there was always going to be a shortfall um, of when the fields really started to suffer and um, you know either dry out either wear away so that's not an overnight fix but it is a, a, a shorter to a medium term fix as we see that because we want you as user groups and sports groups to have the best facilities to teach and coach you know, the, the, the children on and the, and the youngsters on. So, you know, that's a big, big part of what, you know, we're looking at with Angela. And therefore, we we want Angela and the recreation department to become more independent. So we've recommended that, we, that the recreation department buy their own mower so that they can go out and mow the fields when they want, not when with the greatest respect to Jody and his team when they have to wait for Jody and his team to come in to do that. So that gives the team more autonomy to be able to mow the fields. If it's rained the day that Jody and his team were going to come and do it and they couldn't, the next day Angela can come out and mow. You know, and um, you know, she's, she's a game girl as we say. She wants to get on that mower and learn how to use it. So, and yes, she won't be the only one, you know, Chris. Chris is going, what, what? How did I get volunteered for that? You know, but, um, but yeah, uh, so, so again, having the recreation department more autonomous in its, in its, in its view of this facility is, is key to the future success. No matter what, we eventually end up as a blueprint. No matter what, we eventually end up, you know, developing and building and moving and shaping. Um, you know, it's still going to require Angela and her team um, plus the outside support that, that she's getting from, you know, from local contractors, um, you know, grounds maintenance contractors, um, you know, to, to help keep this facility, you know, at the highest level of quality where it should be. So, that's sort of it for the moment, folks. Sorry, I could talk a bit, but uh, you know, Scott says I talk underwater. Well, I said one question. Okay. With all the upgrades you guys are doing, which sounds amazing, new playgrounds, splash pad, all that stuff. Now this might be the job we need, but 
what do you guys do surveillance on top of that? Are you going to put a good system in here so if somebody vandalizes something or destroys something, we can hold them accountable and make them pay for it? Because it would stink to do all that and then somebody comes and starts destroying it. And to be honest, that's an issue. Oh, it is. It's, it's, a, big, it's yeah. a major issue. So I don't know if that's an area of expertise. Oh, right. okay. Vandalism. Was a so the question that was asked, great question, by the way, was, you know, what about surveillance? What about security? What about you know reducing or or or, or um, if you like removing vandalism and things like that from from the you know from the from the potential for this for this facility? And what I would say is that um, part of the strategic um, approach to the interviews was to inter interview the fire chief and the police chief because. We wanted those two guys to give us their input on what they see from their perspective in their roles. So the fire chief had less to say about the facility because um, he generally has, and the fire brigade have less involvement unless they're asked to be involved to check and, and do the fire safety you know, side of things. The police chief was very vocal. Uh, Jerry was, was very forthcoming uh, in, a very, in a very positive way about that and, and he said you know what Ian he said we would love to be able to police this facility 24 7 for the town but we just can't now there are things that we can do so we can put surveillance we can put um, systems in place but he said you know what if Angela because I talked to him about Angela being based up here he said you know what if Angela was here first of all we think that crime would go down by about 50 percent straight away because the sheer fact that nobody's here a lot of the times is when a lot of that crime takes place um, the second point to that is, is he would, he, he, this is going on film, but, you know, he, he sort of suggested that if that was the case, then he could allow officers to spend time educating the, the youth uh, on how to men on how to look after the facility, on, on the, the destroying something would spoil it for many people, not just themselves. So, yes, that will have a great effect to some degree, we know that. And he said that, he was realistic about that. But I think that, yes, one point would be to, to add surveillance, and sadly, sadly, that's what we have to do. Um, because we want to protect the investment, and we certainly don't want people, um, you know, disappointed by vandalism when they've come to use the facility. So that's going to be important. But we also think that the build that they will come attitude will also help. That more activity here more often will actually leave, if you like, those vandals, those trouble causers, less places and less opportunities to, to cause trouble here. Um, so in some cases, the more people coming in, the less the, less the opportunity for them. Um, so it sort of polices itself. And then we add in all of those other layers that, that you're talking about, um, you know, into that. So one of my biggest dreams right now is to be able to have the office here, but to not only have the office here, but to bring in youth to the community to kind of be the leadership component of this space. So they can kind of just be out here, you know, playing around. And then if they're noticing any kind of vandalism happening, they can be those peers that can be like, hey, dude, cut it out, you know? This is our space. But to give them that ownership of actually, this is our place, so let's keep it in good condition. Um, that's yes. a dream in the future. <laughs> I know that it's going to take a while to get there, um, but baby steps is all we can get to. Yeah, so just, just to... Just, just just to sort of repeat what Angela said there, just so we can pick it up on the on the system, is Angela was sort of talking about um, you know letting um, you know a, a leadership, a youth leadership group, you know help um, you know get more involved in the development and the infrastructure of this facility to help the other youth that 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 that, that come here and play here and recreate here and. And sort of and show them that this can be a great place to be. So why destroy it? Why vandalize it? Why you know damage it? Um, so which which I when Angela first sort of you, you know said that to me, I thought it was a wonderful idea. 
Um, I was involved back in the UK with something very similar. Um, the company that I worked for at the time, we had a, our board of directors. And what we did is, um, as a leadership for our industry, which was the groundsmanship industry, um, not my word, but the, that's the word we used, um, is we built a, a young board and, and you, it would sort of as a little bit exclusive because you couldn't be on it if you were over 25. So we would only accept people 25 and younger on this board. And the idea was to try and garner all of that youthful thought, the passion that they had coming into our industry. And then they, would they actually had a seat on our main board and they would advise our board from a youth perspective on what the, the board should be thinking about. And it was hugely successful, and you know our board of directors were amazed at some of the things they came up with. And these guys travelled the world; they were ambassadors for our industry, and they travelled the world just sort of telling their story. And they're still doing it now, and um, it's a it's a great concept. So, you know, so I know that that type of thing will work for sure. Now, will it take a little bit of time and effort to get it off the ground? Absolutely, but it will definitely work. But. Um, so really that's sort of where we are, we've managed to more or less stay within the time. Thanks very much for, you know, for, for listening. Um, we have a question? I have two quick questions. Oh, two. Back to off the pause question, there's going to be some lighting to kind of help us. Oh, sorry, yep, I did forget that one, uh, Mel. Yep, so just so you know, and I'm sorry it wasn't um, uh, added onto this map, um, but we are looking at floodlighting um, going on down on the soccer field. Um, and the idea is that it that it shines into the field, so it won't help, won't hurt with the the residential areas. And I mean, the lighting nowadays. I mean, we work with Moscow Lighting, and they are the best in the business. Um, and the lighting nowadays, there's no what we call um, bleed of that light anymore. So wherever they point the lights, they will they will shine, and and nowhere else. So. Yeah, so that's, that's definitely something that, I think if you look in the plan, I've got it in the plan, it's just that um, I forgot to ask our designer to add it on, so, so my fault there, but yeah. And we were so talking I about a, we'll be part. a bank of them here as well. Yeah, yeah. so we've already had the, 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 the first thoughts from those guys on that. The second question, how are we going to advertise our field? Because right now there's a 3 by 12 sign on a stop sign <laughs> down here coming into the residential area that you described earlier. So if you don't know the fields are here, you wouldn't know where to go. Absolutely. Um, if they can answer part of that is they have a sign for down on, the, on Sullivan Street ordered and they're going to be placing that this summer. Three but I also think we need to put something downtown, give it yep. some direction to show people yes. where to go. Because right now you come across the bridge from Summersworth and you just... Yeah. You don't know anything. So the question was just for the just for the the um, the, the, the camera and the uh, and the, the TV was you know uh, at the moment the, the signage is let's say inappropriate um, for you know um, identifying such a crucial part of the town, um, such a crucial facility to the to the community. So yes, the idea would be that you know as we develop and improve, then. The, the signage and maybe you know the traffic flow to to get here is is certainly going to be looked at and improved um, beyond beyond doubt without without question. Yeah. Last question. Okay. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Restrooms for the families that are coming here for their kids. So if you want to direct a lot a lot of people to come here and enjoy the facility, they need a place to take care of that. Yep. And and important yes. I absolutely agree. So the question was restrooms, and I think that is the single most thing that I wrote on every single common denominator, most common denominator, every without a doubt. So the one thing that everybody said needed to change. So yeah, in, as part of the development of the office space for Angela, we would also develop a bathroom. Um, you, you know. Uh, public bathrooms, or, or or at least user bathrooms, that um, that certainly would be better than porta pots for awesome. sure. Would yeah. they be open 24 hours, or would, would you recommend them? Because part of the issue is the problems that happen here late night. Like yep. Times. Yep. Well, I know that um, other facilities that we've worked at or worked with, um, they do have a a sort of I'll call it a a, a sort of closing time. 
where they closed the facility down and therefore they would close down the bathrooms at that point. So Yeah. Yeah, so I think that you know if um, uh, that would be a suitable approach then that way it would allow all of the user groups and users of the facility to leave at a reasonable time and then the, the facilities are locked up. Um, you know, and then opened up the next morning. And that, that's, that's fairly commonplace, but great question, yeah, you know, we should be able to, um, to close down the facilities at a certain point, um, in somewhat for security, but also just, um, just because it's time to everybody to go to sleep. <laughs> clean up a little. So, uh, and yeah, whoever's gonna clean up, of course. <laughs> Sorry, Angela. Part you know, of the job. Yeah. But um, well, look. Um, any more questions? Fine. Please ask them. We're here till everybody till we lock the bathrooms. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, take take this format home with you. Have another read through it. Have a look through it. If you think something doesn't fit in 24, and it should be in 20. Oh, there isn't a 23. Um, it should be in 24. Then fine. You know, let us know. Again, you know, we're not. We're not, we're not sort of going to turn around and say, nope, we're not doing that, it stays there, because we said so. Um, you know, we'll try and work with everybody, we'll try and be flexible. Um, we, we want as much inclusivity as we can get from this process and from what we, we then hopefully move forward with. So for us, it, it's, it's, um, it's a no-brainer not to listen to you guys um, and, and try and take in everything we can. Um, but one thing that will definitely happen is the pickleball. So there we go. So we If this lady's making a journey back after 25 years, we've got to take care of her for sure. Um, but, well, look, th th thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been great meeting you all for those I haven't met through the interviews or just walk, wander in the town. And, um, yeah, share with your neighbors. Get other people excited. Share those plans around so we can get 10 pickleball players here for the next one. All right. <laughs> and Terry's just informed me that we've got to do that all again because the tape didn't work. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, be safe. Uh, have a great season. Um, you're gonna, you're still gonna see us, unfortunately, but uh, you know, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be coming back up to, to keep an eye on things. All right. Thank you. Have a good night.